Hello everyone, Paul Stetchik with NEPSI. Welcome to this second session on transient current, uh, transient interest current associated with capacitor bank switching. This is our second session. I'm happy to uh, be here with you again. Uh, today we, uh, we're discussing transient interest current associated with capacitor bank switching. It's an important subject um, that uh, anybody in the valve with the design or specification harmonic filters should be following. Um, before I get started with the presentation, we, we learned some things last week that we would like to share with you today. One of those things is, there, is that with YouTube Live, there is a significant delay uh, in your questioning on chat in, in the time period that we received. So last week, we were not able to answer all the questions because I ended the presentation um, before the chats came through. So this week, there will be a five minute period following the presentation uh, where you will be able to ask questions and we will stay online uh, hoping um, to receive them before uh, in, 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 and uh, also answering those. Uh, we also included the possibility of getting what's called PDH contacts, uh, contact hours. You can always convert those to CEU hours uh, if your state allows. So to gain access to those and to get credit for this, it's about 0.5 hours, this presentation, maybe uh, 0.75 hours. Uh, you can uh, you can enter a code at the end and send us an email. So we ask at the beginning of the presentation to send us a message saying, "Hey, I'm present," and at the end of the presentation, I will give you a three uh, three digit code to send to us. You can reply back to our invite or send us an email, and we will send you a certificate for the PDH contact hours. And of course, um, going forward, please uh, send an email to NEPSI uh, or reply back to our calendar invite with any questions that you want us to cover in the future. Uh, so uh, today uh, we're, we're talking about, um, about transient interrush currents. We're going to talk about how to calculate it. We're going to talk about uh, what you do with those results and then we're going to talk about mitigation technologies. Uh, so let's get going with the presentation. So <clears throat> anyways, um, So we, we're interested in capacitor bank switching transients for a number of reasons, but one of those uh, primary reasons is that the capacitor switching itself. Capacitor switching is a difficult task. Vacuum switches that have been developed for capacitor switching uh, have been designed for a transient inrush current and a transient frequency. It's, it required uh, or that you calculate those values and make sure that those values are within the capability of the switching device. If the, if if you exceed those switching devices, you may have a, a possibility of a, a improper closing operation. During the inrush period, when we have a significant amount of harmonic, uh, not harmonic, we have a significant amount of inrush current flow through the contacts of the vacuum switch or vacuum bottle, uh, we may get welding of the contacts or picking of the contacts. And an improper closing operation can lead to an improper opening operation. And it's that opening operation that we actually have more concern about. We have situations in the past where improper closing, pre-strike, and things like that, uh, and opening operations, uh, re-strike caused by transient inrush currents can result in case rupture. So it's a very important matter that the switching device uh, and the amount of inductance or the amount of resistance that we control the transient inrush current associated with the capacitor switching. If we don't control the transient interrupt current with the capacitor switching, we may end up with a failed piece of equipment. Um, so over here, I show a, a, a quick back-to-back -back switching operation. Uh, the red curve is the voltage, and the green curve is the current. And you can see that on closing of the vacuum switch, there's a very high inrush current. That inrush current can be tens of thousands, even a hundred thousand of an amp, hundred thousand amps if you have not included the right amount of inductance into the circuit. So we're going to talk about this today, give you a thorough understanding on what you need to do, how to calculate the transient inrush current, how to calculate the transient, um, the transient inrush current frequency and how to compare that against the switch rating and, uh, and in that way you will be able to design a cap bank or a filter, or a filter bank for that matter that meets the parameters of the switching device. So I've taken a very uh, simple system, and the first thing we're going to talk about today is single, single bank switching. Okay, single bank switching. What we mean by single bank switching is that there are no other capacitor banks in the network. 
we're switching a single capacitive bank as we show here we're showing a thousand kvar we're switching that 1000 kvar bank on uh, with this capacitor switch here and we have inrush current coming from the source the source current is 10 ka so if we were to energize this system uh, with a source uh, short circuit level 10 ka we would get a, a a value of current flow of 914 amps peak okay we have a, a value of 914 amps peak at a frequency of 926 hertz incidentally that's the natural frequency of the system basically it's a tuning point of the system that frequency that you have drawn there that that in itself is not a very high current and single bank switching single capacitor bank switching is never an issue for the switching device and that's because of this level of inductance that exists here. Your source impedance represents a significant amount of impedance. Uh, and for that reason, we do not need to add any type of transient mitigation down here. We do not need any kind of transient mitigation uh, from a transient current standpoint. We are not worried about the switching device. It's going to perform just fine. There's a factor that's often calculated when you do uh, uh, transient interrupt current calculations and that's the IF we take the we take the I which is 914 amps peak and we multiply it times the frequency 926 and we can come up with a value in this case we came up with 848 ka Hertz I divided by a thousand and therefore we call ka Hertz the formulas to calculate the interrupt current and interrupt frequency are listed here we listed here it's very simple uh, formulas it comes from C37.012-2005 uh, uh, from, from those formulas you can calculate the peak current uh, based upon the short circuit level of the system and I1 being the fundamental current rating of the capacitor bank at nominal voltage. You may want to consider using the uh, I1 at, at a 10% over voltage to be conservative with your maximum peak current. And then the frequency is just a matter of dividing the I short circuit current in this case, it was 10 kA, right? Um, and and divided by the fundamental current rating of of the capacitor bank and multiplying by the system frequency and taking the square root of that, that quantity. So it's a very simple process. Incidentally, we have a spreadsheet tool on our website in the resource page to do these calculations. So now we 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 go one step further and we say, well, what is the inrush current if I were to switch on the second capacitor bank? So over here, we have stage one on and we're energizing stage two. So what we've done is we've have, we have stage one on, we're looking to turn on stage two. And when we turn on stage two, there's going to be an inrush current. The first inclination is to think that, well, some, harmonic, some current will flow from, from the source here, from this source, and it does. But the, the majority of the current that does flow is a is what's called back-to-back -back switching current and it's a dumping of the charges located on this capacitor into the uncharged capacitor and that amount of current flow is significant very significant I in this case we calculate 13,250 amps peak so we went from it was here of, of 914 amps uh, peak all the way up to 13,000 13,250 amps peak at a very high frequency of, of, of 26 kilohertz. So very significant. The IF factor, that factor that we talked about calculating is very high. The reason this value is very high is because we have no impedance here. If you think about a, especially a metal closed cap bank, everything is closely coupled. We have just maybe five or 10 feet of bus bar at a value of of, 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 of microhenries per foot, say we used a, a value of 0.5 microhenries per foot, we are just talking a few microhenries, perhaps five microhenries of impedance between uh, stage one and stage two in this case. So you get a very significant draw of current. The calculation procedures are again very, very basic, very simple, and again we have a spreadsheet tool on our website. I encourage you to use it. It's a very effective tool. It walks you through this process. In fact, we show copies of various pieces of standards to allow you to properly choose the switching device to make sure you do it correctly. So if we go on to what would normally be done, and this is almost in almost all cases, 
is when the penis is injected into the circuit, we, we install what we call a TI reactor, but it's a transient inrush reactor. We put a value of reactants in each branch of the capacitor bank to limit the current flow. So what you can see here is that, again, we don't, we assume, I should back up here, um, the, 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 uh, I don't think I mentioned it, the current flow from the source is ignored. Per the standards, we ignore that. And that's because it's perhaps maybe a thousand amps or even less compared to 13,000. So the, the error in the calculation is minimal. So we normally ignore the, the current um, contribution from the source. Um, so in here, I don't show that contribution from the source at all. And uh, we've added basically 40 microhenries per stage here, total of 80 microhenries. And we've limited the current down to a very reasonable value of 3,312 amps. Uh, and the frequency has dropped off significantly. And as a result, this IF product has dropped to 22,123. Uh, so it's a very uh, low value. When you think about what IF is, IF is more or less DIDT, the instantaneous rate or the instantaneous change in current over time. Okay. So if you think about contacts closing, if you have contacts closing on each other, if the DIDT is very high, you're going to get a very high amount of current through the contacts and that risks the 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 uh, the welding of the contacts during the closing operation and then during opening it needs to break that weld and that can be sometimes difficult and cause problems during the interruption process so it's important to keep the IF factor this IF factor as well as the peak current and the frequency of the inrush current within the ratings of the switching device um, so the, the practice is to determine what value of inductance I need to bring these two values, or actually technically three values, the peak current, the peak current inrush frequency, and the IF factor within the rating of the device. So just in summary, <clears throat> I show the peak inrush current. We started with 914 amps for a single bank switching. Again, not a problem. If you have a switching device that's ready for the short circuit of the system, the inrush current associated with single bank switching will always be less than the fault current rating of the device, and therefore you will never have a problem. We then did a, a switching operation where we had no impedance in the network. Sometimes we'll see this uh, from various suppliers of motor control centers. They will install capacitor banks within the motor control center, and they will forget to put inductance in it. And you would get very high current flow. So here, with no impedance in the circuit, we have 13,250 amps. And incidentally, this exceeds a lot of ratings on a lot of devices, uh, and it would it would potentially fail a switching device. We then added uh, inductance into the circuit, transient interruption reactors, and we reduced that current to 3,312 amps. And this is a acceptable value of inrush current. Inrush frequency, same type of analysis. We're showing what the transient inrush frequency was. Uh, single bank switching, not an issue. Uh, for for back-to-back -back switching, where we turn that second stage on, where there's no no inherent impedance added to the circuit, we we've increased the the inrush current to 26, the inrush frequency to 26.7 kilohertz. So quite significant uh, frequency change, and uh, that's going to be seen across the contacts of the switch. Adding inductance to the network drops that frequency down significantly. And then finally, the IF product. We went from an IF product of 848 for single bank switching uh, for back, and then to, to 353,000 for back-to-back -back switching. So this is very significant, exceeds the rating of most switching devices. And we then add some impedance and we drop it to 22,123. So very low. So, Adding transient inrush reactors is one of the key ways um, transient inrush current is handled in metal closed cap banks uh, and al also in open air capacitor banks. Add a little bit of microhenries to the circuit and you solve the problem. This is a copy of the spreadsheet tool that's on our website. I encourage you to go there. There's many leaves. Some of those cite the, uh, the types of breakers that are out there in their switching ratings. Uh, so it's a good resource tool for, for anybody to use. In this, we, the calculation procedure is to enter the system voltage, the short circuit 
for the single bank switching and then the system frequency. And then we are just adding the uh, K-bar of the system and the microhenries associated with that stage. In this case, we put 2.5 microhenries. And what we're doing is we're doing a calculation here, no and rush reactors. This is, the actual, this is the actual spreadsheet tool that was used to develop this presentation. And you can see the solution here. Okay, so 2.5 microhenries represents the, the, the inductance, the inherent inductance of the metal closed cap bank, the bus bar work between stage one and stage two. And generally speaking, it's gonna be on the order of maybe just 10 feet. So not a whole lot of, of distance there, and it's 0.5 microhenries per foot is a good value to use for, for inductance of bus bar inside a cap bank. I then added 40 microhenries to each stage, and I recalculated the values. And that's what this spreadsheet uh, is showing. So go to our website, check that out. It's a very useful tool. So an interesting factoid that is is um, is what does what does that 40 microhenries look like? Okay, and if you were to do the calculation for an overhead line, overhead distribution line, like this, you would come up with a value of just 115 feet. So if we were doing an open air pole mount cap bank, which NEPSI does not supply, but if we were to do one of those, the amount of conductor that would typically exist between two pole spans at 13.8 kV uh, would be greater than 40 microhenries, and you could be within the switch rating. So nothing significant has to be done for pole mount cap banks where you have a couple pole spans of distance between. That's all it takes. The calculations are based upon the GMD, the spacing of the conductors here, uh, and the fact that the pole is typically 45 feet high, you come up with a value of 0.348 microhenries per foot. Okay, so the calculation is very easy. You use the same value of inductance here in the spreadsheet tool, you'll come up with a value that's reasonable. A half mile of spacing between cat banks is absolutely not required. I've read in some places where people say space to capacitor banks a half a mile apart, not required. One pole span apart is adequate. Inside our cap banks, we don't have the luxury of adding 115 feet of overhead power line. So we add what's called a transient and rush reactor. We show one of those here. This is a VPI um, air core reactor, something that is produced by some of our reactor suppliers and basically they take magnet wire, they wrap it around a spindle, and we mount that uh, air core reactor within our bus work itself. We recommend that you always specify something that's been VPI impregnated. Don't accept PVC type pipe uh, uh, inductors. We have some suppliers out there that'll take PVC pipe that they purchased at Home Depot, wrap it around the pipe, and then say it's in a rush reactor using this 600 volt THHN wire. We recommend that you go to a reputable supplier of reactors and have the reactors built by then. But it's small. You can see here that uh, 40 microhenries is easy to develop within a metal closed system for typical stage sizes. It's compact and it's very small and very inexpensive. It is by far the least expensive way to deal with transient and rush current than any other method out there. I have a table over here, it's table one. And what this table represents is, is the amount of inductance you need at each and every voltage level. One of the interesting things about the equations from C37 is that, is that the system voltage determines the inductance, not the megavars of the stage, not the fundamental current rating of the stage, but rather the voltage of the system. The system voltage determines the amount of inductance it takes for, to receive a certain constant I F factor, the IF product I'm talking about. So at 13.8 kV, we recommend at least 49 microhenries, 49 microhenries between the stages. So 49 microhenries between the stages, if we were to round that off to 50 microhenries, it'd be 25 microhenries per, per stage with a reactor that's rated 25 microhenries. That would limit the transient in rush for a typical vacuum switch that's used in the marketplace, a capacitive rated vacuum switch to 50% of its rating. So it's not a whole lot of inductance required to do this. 
and it's not difficult to get to a rating that's one half of the switch rating. We, we stress this point that you want to limit the transient and rush IF product to 50%, 50% of the switch rating. And you do that because you do not want to take a risk and have an improper closing operation that might result in an improper opening operation. Improper opening operation can result in flash over the equipment and it can result in, in case rupture of the capacitor or blown fuse operations. So it's very important to make sure that you account for transient interrush. Another interesting thing to point out is that for, for um, harmonic filter banks, the iron core reactor provides the function of transient interrush. That iron core reactor has significant amount of impedance and therefore you do not need to worry about transient interrush. You never have to worry about transient interrush with harmonic filter banks because the iron core reactor or the air core reactor if it were open air system uh, would add enough impedance into the network that transient interrush is not a concern. Not a concern. And that's me by the way standing there. That's a, that's a big reactor. Um, so switching technology. I have listed here what NEPSI uses for switching technology. And if there's one thing you want to always think about with metal closed cap banks and harmonic filter banks, there's only a few components. You got reactors, you got capacitors, you got fuses, you got control and protection, and you got switching devices. There's only five or six devices it, that make up these systems. It's somewhat insignificant. What's very important is that the switching device, you need to use a switching device that's proper for the project. Don't cheap out on the switching device. If you have a switching device and you cheap out on the switching device, you buy an inexpensive or a partially rated switching device and it can't quite do the job, the ramifications are flashover in the equipment or case rupture, blown fuse conditions, and your equipment just not acting reliably. Uh, as a general rule of thumb, NEPSI will use a 25 kV switch on a 15 kV system. Why? Because the vacuum switch has a much significant rating at 25 kV. It can interrupt the capacitive current that much better and prevent the possibility of restrike. So always pick a device that's well rated for the application. We use various devices from ABB, um, and that includes their contactors. And we use the capacitor switches, the PS15, the PS25, there's a 200 and a 400 amp rating. And uh, we use also vacuum and SF6 breakers. There's a slightly difference in ratings here. We're gonna discuss that in just a moment. And there's some other technology. We have an ABB DS1, which we will talk about. These devices do not require the ABB DS1 and the VD4CS, as well as the Southern States Cap Switcher, do not need transient interrush reactors because there's a, either they're doing synchronous closing or there's a pre-insertion resistor uh, in the case of a Southern States cap switcher. And in the case of a ABB DS1, there's a pre-insertion diode. So we're gonna talk about those two. But transient inrush reactors are not required. And then finally, there's also what's called a zero voltage control, ZBC control, or synchronous closing control. Those are all different names. But in that case, they're using, there's a controller that's taking a off the shelf switch like this PS25 and they're applying um, a controller that will time the closing of the contacts such that the contacts kiss at the moment the system is crossing through zero and as such zero uh, voltage closing is often is called um, you you will limit that inrush current also in the system uh, so we're going to talk about these these different technologies so the first one is uh, is the breaker we show here a VD4 breaker Breakers come with what's called a C1 and C2 rated uh, rating to it. And the C1 and C2, and for IEC, by the way, there's what's called a C0 rating. The C1 and C2 rating basically determines what is the probability of restrike. What restrike is, is that the capacitor bank opens, it interrupts current, but the vacuum bottle was not able to, re to achieve its, its dielectric uh, requirements to prevent current flow. As the, as the voltage swings away from the system voltage. So there's a significant amount of recovery voltage within, within, the, con within the vacuum contactor itself. 
uh, so you get a reconduction. That's called a restrike condition. When you have restrike, you have a phenomenon called doubling of the voltage. You double the voltage in the cat bag. And oftentimes, the doubling of the voltage then re results in a redoubling of the voltage, and you go to four times. So restrike conditions oftentimes uh, result in, in a flashover within the equipment. So it's important to always pick a breaker when you're doing capacitor switching that has a C2 rating. Go with a very low probability. Do not accept a C1 rated breaker. Accept only a C2 rated breaker because it's been tested for capacitor switching and it's been determined that the capacitor switch has a very low probability of restrike. We're trying to avoid that possibility of a system flashover within the gear. Um, so if you go further down here, there was the C2 rating of a breaker. They will publish a value of inrush making current and for the IEEE standards, that would typically be 20 kA, and they also publish a inrush frequency, 4.25 kilohertz for the IEEE standards. And for the IEC standards, there's different values. I always advise that you go to, this, to the published data, even potentially ask for the test reports, and get the inrush making current and the inrush frequency. You take this inrush current and inrush frequency and come up with what's called the IF factor, that I times F that we showed in the previous slides. Come up with that IF factor and compare that to the breaker. You need, your system should have an IF factor that's less than what the breaker's rated. And again, NEPSI recommends 50%. Multiply the I times F of your cap bank based upon the inductance that you have installed. Make sure that it's one half or 50% of the 20 kA times 4.25 or the IF rating of the breaker. And that's our recommendation. You also would do the same for the IEEE, for the IEC standards, same exact thing. The, the um, let me go back here. Um, this is a breaker. It's got fault interrupting capability. And uh, it's very common that we would use such a device, especially on larger cat banks, larger cat banks. You also have a vacuum switch, a P, and this is the PS15 um, or PS25 from ABB, uh, and it goes up to 20, basically up to 25 kV. It's a single phase device, solenoid operated, either rated 200 amps or 400 amps. It too has a uh, transient making current and a transient making frequency. And you can come up with an IF factor by multiplying 12,000 amps times 6,000 hertz and come up with that IF factor. Again, you're going to compare uh, your calculation within your capacitor bank based upon the inductance that you have installed. And you can compare that against the switch rating. You want it to be at 50% or on that order of magnitude. And that's our recommendation here, 50%. So <clears throat> we're going to talk about some other technologies. So breakers and switches need inductance. You need to add inductance to get within the rating of the switching device. ABB has another device called the DS1. And um, this is uh, a, a, a switch that uses diode switching technology. And I will explain quickly what it does. Uh, but within the pole structure here, there is a diode. And uh, that's what we show here. When it, in the open state, there is no power flow because the main contacts are open and the bypass contacts are open. When you want the switching device to actually operate, the, the main contact closes here. Main contact closes here. When the diode is in a reverse bias state, so they do it when it's in a reverse bias state. So in other words, under a condition by which this diode will not conduct because of the voltage across the diode does not conduct. And so doing, they wait for the system to cross through a natural uh, zero voltage uh, point, and then the current will start to flow. And it's a seamless transition from no current flow to current flow, and therefore no transient current. And then once the current flows, the bypass is accomplished here. They close the bypass switch. So it's transient free on closing. Incidentally, they do the same thing in reverse on the opening sequence it's a very um, it's a it's a very good switching device. Um, they, the same exact thing is done. They they start here in the conduction period. They interrupt um, the by, they, they interrupt the bypass switch here. Force current to flow through. 
the dial, they do that at a time period uh, when it is forward biased, in other words, conducting, and when the system passes through and brings the dial to reverse bias, the, the current flow ceases to exist, and then they open the main contact here. So the, the, the advantage of the DS1 is that there is not a critical timing necessary for this operation. They have a complete, almost a complete half cycle of time uh, of the closing of the main contacts here. They have a half a cycle of time actually be to, 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 to hit it. There is not an issue of, of timing and this is an important uh, element of the DS1. It works uh, good. We have supplied many, many systems uh, switching up to eight megabars at a time. In fact, we uh, our active our solution uses a DS1, and uh, we switch 24 megabars on uh, in a single shot, all in the same cycle. It's a very repeatable switch. And it works very well. Another device um, that we oftentimes apply, especially at the 38 kV, this is a a a uh, switch that's used uh, in the renewables industry. It's a Southern States cap switcher. It uses uh, pre-insertion resistor technology. Um, and um, let me see. All right, I've lost a slide. All right, so it uses pre-insertion resistor technology similar to the DS1. What, what is in fact doing is, is putting a resistor into the circuit, is doing a pre-charge on the capacitor, and then that resistor is bypassed. And in so doing, they, the resistor is replacing the transient inrush reactor. That's what we're doing. We're inserting a value of resistance into the circuit. We're, we're, we're um, knocking down the transient current flow into the capacitor bank because we've inserted resistance into the capacitor bank, and therefore we reduce that transient current. Um, so uh, the key point to Southern States cap switcher is you do not need transient and rush currents. It's a widely used switch in the renewables area and to some degree it's been the de facto standard for many years now until this uh, VD4 has come along. So the VD4 CS is a transient free capacitor switch. It utilizes servo motors and the servo motors accelerate and decelerate the contact closing of the poles independently uh, such that they synchronously close at zero voltage. This switch, one of the, the biggest selling points of this switch is number one, it's got a fault current rating. That Southern States CAT switcher does not have a fault current rating. So we can sometimes get rid of the feeder breaker within our, our within the capacitor bank, that within the within the system that feeds the capacitor bank. So we can eliminate some costs as a, from an overall system standpoint. Um, the other advantage is that this device has been tested, okay, to 1200 amps and 10,000 operations electrically. So it's not just a mechanical test that's been conducted, it's been an electrical test and it's been confirmed in the laboratory uh, under electrical load that it in fact functions transient free. And it's a big selling point. And it comes out in there and ABB's warranty. Uh, so we strongly suggest you think about the possibility of using that switching device, especially at the 38 kV level um, in the renewables area. Another type of control is zero voltage closing control. And the philosophy here is that is that you have a controller, and we show one here. This is a system that we're, we're just uh, putting into operation now and uh, we're using what's uh, called a zero voltage closing control. This is an independently sold um, controller. The controller interfaces with an off-the-shelf device like, like the PS25 or any other device that has single pole switching. The ZVC control will time, you calibrate it at the factory here, you calibrate it uh, so that the, the, the length of time it takes the contacts to close is, is built into the switching device in and the timing is such that the contacts will close at zero voltage closing. Um, <clears throat> we think that uh, it, first of all, adds a lot of complexity to the equipment. Uh, when you think about um, what you see here in the top left corner, it adds a lot of complexity to a metal closed system. We, we at NEPSI um, uh, do not oftentimes see a requirement for such technology. And the reason being is that at the medium voltage level, typically 
transient uh, mitigation is most easily accomplished with transient and rush reactors. We use the ABB VD, uh, VD4CS, the ABB DS1, and, and the Southern States cap switchers in the renewables area and in the motor start area because we are switching many, many, many megavars. So typically eight megavars, sometimes 15 megavars at a time. And transient inrush is difficult to, to protect against using transient inrush reactors when we get to such high values. So in those cases, we like the transient mitigation uh, technology employed by those devices. Um, this this uh, independent type control system, uh, we have not had the ability to get an experience with it in the field and to understand exactly how it works uh, and whether it works or not. Uh, so it's something to, to think about. You're adding complexity to the system by adding these controls and typically it's done on, on systems with smaller stages and typically what we have seen is you do not need such such um, such a device for switching small banks. It's only when we get to large banks that we need some type of control. Uh, we like the uh, other devices because they're they're been tested as a system rather than as independent devices. Uh, we have done some work here at our factory to verify that the device actually does what it what it says it should do. This is kind of some of the these the um, recordings that we have taken. Uh, what we do at the factory doesn't account for all the possibilities. We have concerns over well, what happens when the voltage drops, what happens with temperature change, um, what happens as the age of the switch changes, the linkages, the oil, the contact surfaces, and, and so forth. Um, there is a condition where we can have pre-strike. As the contacts start to close, the, the, the voltage can arc across the open contacts. So even though timing has been calibrated, what about pre-strike is it accounted for? Um, and then uh, we don't understand how the feedback works. And of course, there's improper commissioning. So it's a technology that does exist and um, we do supply it. Um, the, the thing I also, I wanna point out is that we have also seen that in harmonic filter banks, transients are almost non-existent. And that's because we have this very large harmonic filter reactor uh, that is that is sitting there uh, and is representing a significant impedance to transient inrush and therefore you mitigate you mitigate against transient conditions. Um, when you look at zero voltage closing, always think about capacitor bank zero voltage closing versus a, a harmonic filter bank, no zero voltage closing. There are especially in the substation style cap banks that are used in industrial plants to cost of a harmonic filter can sometimes be about the same cost as a cat bank with transient inrush, uh, zero voltage closing control. So it's a trade-off in cost. I can buy a harmonic filter that can mitigate against resonance, it can filter harmonics, and it also mitigates against transient inrush versus a ZVC control in a cat bank where you still have a resonance concern. So this is something to always think about. Look at the trade cost differences. So anyways, to, in conclusion, um, we today we, we showed how to do the transient inrush calculations. It's a simple process. Use the spreadsheet tool is even simpler. Uh, confirm the inrush calculations against a switching device. What switching device are you using? Compare it, make sure you're within 50% of that value. Um, and consider harmonic filters as an effect in cost effective way to mitigate capacitor bank and switching transients. So. Um, anyways, um, so that completes the presentation for today. Um, next week's session, we're going to talk about power factor. We're going to digress. We're going to go to power factor. It's a two-part series uh, on on power factor, and um, and um, we're going to talk about the basics of power factor correction. So I'm looking here. I think I see some questions. Why is uh, inrush current 10 times rated current? And um, I think that's single stage switching. And uh, the, the reason being that the reason you would have 10 times rated current, especially if it was a single bank switching, I'm not sure if that's what you're talking about, but uh, 
I believe, a single bank switching. Remember that the capacitor on NRush is, is the voltage on the capacitor is near zero, and the, and the current, uh, the voltage across capacitor cannot change instantaneously, so you get a very high NRush current to make up for that. So you get a very significant NRush current. Okay, we got what about fuse rating and capacitor banks? That's another question. Uh, that's a good question. In general, um, fuse rating is typically sized uh, between 1.5 and 2.0 times the stage rating so, or, or times the capacitor rating. So we calculate how much current will flow into the capacitor. We put an external fuse associated with it. Typically, the fuse rating is picked at a value of 1.5 to 2.0 times that times that capacitor current. And that's the, the general rule of how you do it. Of course, there are some other things you want to look for, case rupture during, during, um, uh, during failure and things like that. But from an inrush standpoint, if you size it near that 2.0 factor, you will not have uh, a possibility of, of, of fuse operation due to transient inrush current if you have followed uh, the appropriate inrush current calculations per the, the procedures that we have shown here. Uh, somebody's asking how much cost is a 15 kV 20 microhenry inductor. Typically, the inductors that we're supplying are 40 microhenries. Again, we're going for that 50% rated value, uh, but a 40 microhenry inductor may be $600 uh, per phase. So you're adding potentially $1,800 total uh, to a to a to a three-phase bank, and that's really a sell price. Uh, so. And then I got another question here. How does the analysis change when there are more than two stages in the system? Does the third stage need a bigger reactor? Um, the, the, um, each, each and every time you add a stage to a capacitor bank, you, you add another path of current, another flow of current into that switch. So if you add more stages, you add more inrush current. You need to deal with more inrush current to the system. Uh, so more so the answer to your question is you get more inrush current um, there is procedures our spreadsheet shows how to do it uh, you come up with an equivalent uh, impedance for those stages that are on and all those stages will dump into the stage that's being energized another question is how much does it cost all right that question we already answered the cost for that 20 microhenry reactor can i get the um, presentation also last week's presentation is there a link um, send us an email and uh, we'll, we'll, we can probably get you a link for that. Okay, Matt, you already got that question. Um, thank you, Matt. Uh, okay, so, so Christiane asked, uh, do you need to develop uh, equations in spreadsheets or do you use EMTP software? So on our website, under the resource page, we have, and also I believe on the calculators page, we have all the formulas that we showed today, those C37 formulas uh, programmed into Excel, and you can input the data there and come up with your values. EMTP software would be just a very, very complicated way to approach this problem. Not recommended, not necessary. Yes, so somebody's already looked at the spreadsheet and they have determined that it goes up to eight steps. That is correct. Uh, it's a great spreadsheet, it works very well. Incidentally, the spreadsheet also works for outrush calculations. We have another spreadsheet on our website for outrush calculations. That's a topic for another presentation. Uh, so somebody's asking, what's the duration of the inrush current? Uh, the peak happens uh, very quickly. It's within microseconds. And typically, the transient decay is within a half cycle. If you look at the transient decay, it will be nearly gone within a half cycle of time. All right, somebody's saying our filter reactors are quite big. It may minimize inrush current, but it can cause issues related to transient recovery voltage. Can you recommend on that? Uh, so, we have often been told about transient recovery voltage in harmonic filter banks. We have yet to have an issue with the transient recovery voltage. 
Uh, it is our belief that if you're using a C2 rated device or a capacitor rated device, that those devices have already accounted for a significant amount of recovery voltage and the transient recovery has not been an issue. And I speak from a medium voltage standpoint, 2.4 kV through 38 kV. At that voltage rating, we have never had a re issue with transient recovery voltage uh, with the switching devices we use. Okay, requesting PDH credits. Uh, please send an email um, to either paul.stetchik at nepsi.com. I would ask that you send us the code of 456. Thank you for reminding me uh, that PDH contact hours to get that. Uh, we'll send you a certificate. If you send us an email, you can either reply back to the calendar invite or just send us an email at sales at nepsi.com. Say you were present, who you were. Matt has recorded everybody that was in the chat and uh, let us know that's four, five, six is cold and we'll give you the PDH hours that, uh, that, you, that you reference. And uh, there's a question about uh, pre-insertion resistance, I mean. Okay, uh, when, when you, we use a pre-insertion switch, how can we be sure that we need to conduct a transient study in order to verify the acceptable I times F factor? Uh, so, so there is a question about the transient, um, the, the actual switch itself. And uh, I'm going to switch back to my presentation just for a moment um, and show you what is typically done. This was a slide that I was missing, but I found it. Um, here we go. Uh, so, so when you order, and this is particularly true for a Southern States cap switcher, Southern States has already done the calculations based upon megavar ratings of the stages. So what you have here is the actual uh, switching device itself. You have a capacitor bank and you have your closing resistor and your interrupter contacts and your resistor contacts. So what Southern States has done is that they come up with a cap bank sizes for the various applied voltages of the system, whether it's 15.5 kV, 27 kV, or 38 kV. And they have come up with a value of resistance based upon the installed megavar within the cap bank itself to give you a value of resistance that's recommended. The, the, the um, Southern States cap switcher has the resistor built into the pole structure here. So what you're seeing here are differential CTs within our, within our system. These are, uh, the, this is the Southern States cap switcher, the resistors within the pole. Southern States is sizing that um, is sizing that resistor for you according to the contact ratings of your switching device. Okay, I think that uh, completes the questions. If anybody's got one, just pop in real quick. I'll wait in just another moment. I'll wait a couple more minutes. You guys gotta listen to this music we got for you. Okay, guys, well, that's it. Uh, don't forget, next week, um, we will do Power Factor. I guarantee that we will talk about something next week. Present Power Factor in a way that you have not seen before. We got the beer mug kind of a thing. We'll re show the beer mug and the foam on top. But we have some other things that we will show uh, that you have not seen before. In particular, the bare essence of Power Factor and, and um, how, how it all comes about. So thank you for attending. We look forward to doing this again every week. Every Thursday, 2 o'clock Eastern, New York time. Thanks.